Shvatos and Masay are, are most often, uh, what do you call it? Combined. They're combined, but since it was a, a, a leap year, so they, the, the parshas are divided up. Now, Parshas Matos begins with the uh, um, Parshas Matos begins with a command. Moshe speaks to the heads of the tribes. This is what Hashem has commanded. And a man makes a vow. Oh, he shava shvua, or he makes an oath. Less or iser al nafsho to prohibit something. Lo yachal devaro, he might not profane his word. How does the article translate it? Um, he shall not desecrate his word, profane his word. Kechol ayotze mipiviasa, he should do whatever he vows. Now you get into this, uh, you get into this uh, 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 section of neders. You ever hear people say bli neder? Yep. Bli neder, people say it all the time. That means you're officially from, by the way, if you say bli neder. It's, uh, uh, the, 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 but, but there is grounds for saying bli neder because if you say something and it's something like for a mitzvah, for example, something simple, if somebody says, I'm going to visit my parents today, and it's a mitzvah, so then you have an obligation to do it. If a person says, like, a, any mitzvah, unless you, that's why you should all get used to saying, bli netter, just say it at correct time. And that, the the bal tshuva sometimes mixes up, and somebody says, hi, how are you? And you say, oh, bli netter. Right, that is incorrect. So, so the, the, there should, it, it just make sure you use it in the proper context, that's all. But the bli netter is very important, otherwise a person is bound, a person is bound by his word. And so a person should get used to, number one, not making netters, and number two, a person, kechol hayotze mi piviasa, a person should do whatever comes out of his mouth, the Torah says, that, 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 that get used to doing what you say you're going to do. A person says something, you should do it. If you said so, you're going to do it, even if it's not officially a netter. If you said you're going to do something, you should do it. Keep your word. A person, we have to learn to keep our word. Uh, if you don't keep your word, then you can become the Prime Minister of Israel. But, other, but for people who, who don't have political aspersions, aspirations, uh, uh, so then, uh, then you do, uh, a decent person should keep their word. That's what the Torah says. Now, the first thing is that a, um, the question is, you'll notice that who does Moshe say this to? This whole section is addressed to whom? To the heads of the tribes of the Jewish people. Why? Why you, you never find this before? You know, because this is a mitzvah that applies to everybody else. It doesn't say, all right, Moshe spoke to, to the heads of the tribes that don't wear shotness. Moshe spoke to the heads of the tribes that don't eat pork. It doesn't say that. It speaks to the entire Jewish people. Why, when it comes to this idea of, of being careful with vows and oaths and pledges, and why is he speaking to the heads of the Jewish people? What do you say? Why? Why is it a Kalva Homer if they could do it, everyone else should do it? And they're to the contrary, I would argue that the esteemed people I expect better behavior from. Who says that the average man could do it? Might the Kalva Homer work? You're right, there is a certain. What do you say, Ethan? Um, it's like when I give my word to someone while wearing a kippa, it's not just my word, it's the word of the tribe that I belong to because I'm wearing the kippa. So they represent something higher, so you guys got to be careful because you represent something right. higher, okay? Okay, not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. Uh, 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 the Mephorshim say, yeah, what do you say, Ezra? Sometimes people in power will help them lie. The Mephorshim say that. That's exactly what the Mephorshim say. Who we're talking to? We're talking to heads of the tribes. You know, they might make promises, and they might promise you this and promise you that, and they want to, especially if there's somebody chosen by the community, and I'm going to do this for you, like politicians. You know, there's an Israeli prime minister. There's an Israeli prime minister. Did two things. One of them was that he made a coalition agreement. You know how coalition governments work? Yep. So you have a group that they're going to go with you, and they group, and then you put together your coalition. He was a prime minister. And after the election and the other political party went with him and put him in power, he kind of did not carry out his commitments to this political power. So one of the guys came to him in the office and said, Sir, you signed a document with our, po with our party that you're going to do this, that, and the other. He said to them, hang the document on the wall. Oh, I saw that picture. 
He said, hang the document on the wall. That was one line he came up with. Then he came up with another one, which has become more of a catchphrase in Israel. This is the real winner. Somebody said to him after, what I think it was an interview, this was an interviewer. He said, Mr. Prime Minister, you know, before the elections, you promised that you're going to do this, this, and the other. He said, I never promised to keep my promise. <laughs> You know, and, you know, and in Israel, when you hear something, you just kind of go, oh, oh okay, oh, right, now that makes sense. Oh, yeah. You know, the, 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 the contradiction and the inherent contradiction, nobody even pays attention. They just go, oh, okay, all right, okay. That's like, they had once, they, I couldn't make this up if I wanted to. You know, the Kinneret is the main body of water in Israel. I think now they have underwater, uh, what do they call aquifers? Desalination. Desalination, aquifers, whatever it's called. But the, the Kinneret for many years was the main body. It still is the main body. It's a, it's a critical uh, body of water in Israel. So they have what's called, we had about four or five years of drought in a row. And they have what's called the imaginary red line in the Kinneret. The Kinneret had actually gotten, because of the drought, it had gotten to within 10 centimeters of this red line, what they call the red line. So they said to the Minister of Agriculture, on a live broadcast in what is theoretically a first world country, they said to him, sir, what are you going to do if the Kinneret drops down to the red line? He said, it's not a problem. We will erase the red line and draw it lower. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and when you live in Israel, you just kind of go, oh, okay, oh, all right, <laughs> that'll, that'll take care of it. That, that should do it. <laughs> Living here is different, gentlemen. It just is. What can I tell you? It just is. We had a guy once, one year, one year, at a pair of Pesach. There were guys from the yeshiva who were burning chametz outside the front of the yeshiva. The train, the light rail, <laughs> the light rail is running. All of a sudden, it stops. And the conductor gets off the train and runs over with a bag of chametz. And he says, hey, I was looking for a fire. I needed a fire. He throws his chametz in. And the whole train just stops. <laughs> the whole train. <laughs> and, 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 and I went, you know, and, you know the, the, the joke of it all is, if anyone on the train would say, Wait, you don't see what's happening? He's going to burn his chametz. What's with you? <laughs> that's, all, that's all part of the fun. That's all part of the fun. So, so the, the first idea here is that, 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 that these are people who are vulnerable. The leaders, high officials, are people who may, you know, they may start promising and, 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 and as we see in politics all the time, number one. Number two, how did they become leaders? This is the real shot. The other one is more tongue, it's kind of tongue in cheek. This is the real, uh, the real pshat. The real pshat is the Torah wants to emphasize to you what the power of a word is. This man was an ordinary citizen. How did he become, how did he become a leader of a tribe? One day Moshe Rabbeinu said to him, you're the leader of a tribe. With one sentence you've changed the status. That's the power of a word. The difference between <coughs> capital punishment and not capital punishment is a sentence. You know where that exists? Where does that exist? The difference between capital punishment and not getting capital punishment. Execution and not getting execution. You know where that exists? But where could one sentence make the difference? A warning the judge's mouth? That's for sure. He says, you die. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't want to hear that from a judge. Yeah, yeah. The electric chair for you, yeah, that's a bad day. But that, that's not, where, where is it, where to make a difference? Imagine a man and a woman have an affair. This is a woman who somebody gave a ring to in front of witnesses. But he didn't say, Hareat Mikudesh Asli. She's not liable for death penalty. That's not considered adultery. She's not a married woman. All he had to have done is while he gave the ring in front of witnesses say, Hareat Mikudesh Asli, her whole status has changed. You understand? That's the power of a word. And therefore, the Torah is telling you number one, these people are a living example of what a word could do. What a word changes the status of something. The word changed them from an ordinary citizen into a, into a what do you call it, into a, a leader of a tribe, number one. Number two, it says, Kechol Now, here you have, you know, the classic example people come to all the time. Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky Zatzal was known as the absolute man of truth. He lived to 95. They said to him, why did you, uh, what, to what do you ascribe your long life? He said, I never knowingly told a lie. I never knowingly told a mistruth. Not only that, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky was very upset. 
he was uh, he was five years old. He was on, he was on the way to Cheder, and uh, he came late because he had been helping somebody like his grandfather or something. And on the way to the Cheder, there was a construction site. The guys were building. And he got late to the Cheder. And the Rebbe said to him, why did you come late? He says, I had to help my grandfather's not. Well, I was home helping with my grandfather. And the Rebbe said, that's not true. You stopped, because the kids apparently liked watching these workers. He said, you stopped to watch these workers, and he gave him a slap across the face. Rebbe Yankov Kamenetsky said, that Rebbe was guilty. What was he guilty of? The Rebbe should have known as a kid, he should have known me that I am telling the truth that I was a kid who doesn't lie. He should have known that. Oh, not the potch. The potch, he used the potch for different things. That was not, it was only modern liberal, modern liberal approach. You know, you're never allowed to touch kids in school. You know, now that's a much more liberal. Obviously, you got to be careful. You can't go smash. Now, the Torah, from a Torah perspective, a little buddy called here, there, and everywhere. You know, it's not Nishke Ferlach. That was what he was upset about. What he was upset about was that the Rebbe should have known that this kid isn't lying. And as a parent, you should know that. You should know your kids well enough to know when your kid is telling you the truth when he's lying. And you should know your kid which kid could lie and which kid won't lie. You should know your kids well enough that it shouldn't even be a question. I told you I once, my older brother who was, who was always studying, which was a complete opposite of myself, so he was always studying. He was either studying Gemara, when he was in high school, he was either studying Gemara or studying physics. But he's always studying. And I was doing exactly the same but the opposite. <coughs> so I would periodically go and I would, you know, I'd start, I'd say, yo, what was his name, Yosef, I'd say, yeah, let's, go, let's go out and play. I'd have a baseball glove, I'd have two gloves, let's go play catch. The dove would get away, I'm studying. I'd say, come on, come on, let's go play. I'd say, get away, right? So first I would start flicking the light switch in the room. I was like, he's a dove, cut it out. And then when they said, let's go play, he'd cut it out. And when that didn't work, so I would get closer and eventually kind of do like this, start, you know, poking away at his thing. So I'm about, you know, 11 years old, 12 years old, and I'm poking the safer. It always ended, he would always say, jump up, he's a little older than me, he would jump up, and he would punch me one shot right on top of the shoulder, it hurt like heck. It was one shot, and then he'd be upset with me for getting him to the point where he had to punch me, because he was a real sodic. So then I remember this one time he hits me, <laughs> he put on like this, and uh, my father's reading the Wall Street Journal, and I go down, I said, Dad, Yosef hit, Yosef punched me. He never even put down the paper. He just goes, don't bother people, you won't get punched. Right? <laughs> I was devastated. I was absolutely devastated. How do you know it was him? It was, maybe he's guilty. Maybe, but how do you know it was my fault? Maybe it was his fault. Maybe he started, because he knew. Because <laughs> he knew. And as a parent, you should know. Right, you should know. And that's where, yeah, back in the next to with this Rebbe. The Rebbe should have known that he's not lying, number one. Number two. And this is what's incredible. Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, when he was 90 years old, he started, the day he became 90 years old, he finished davening, and he put on Rabbeinu Tam Tefillin. You know some people after davening put on Rabbeinu Tam Tefillin, there's Rashi Tefillin, and there's Rabbeinu Tam Tefillin. So some people do it, some people put it on every day. At 90 years old, he started putting on Rabbeinu, had never put on Rabbeinu Tam Tefillin before. So somebody once said to him, so one of his grandchildren, somebody said to him, why are you putting on Rabbeinu Tam children? Uh, Rabbeinu Tam children, Rabbeinu Tam Tzfilin. He said when he was 40 years old, he was a Rebbe in Torah Vadas in New York. Roshraga Feivel Mendelowitz was the founder of Torah Vadas, and Roshraga Feivel Mendelowitz had certain Hasidic roots. Rabbi Yankov Kamenetsky was the ultimate Litvak. And Roshraga Feivel Mendelowitz was the founder of Torah Vadas. And he said to Rabbi Yankov Kamenetsky, you know what, you ought to start wearing Rabbeinu Tam Tzfilin. So Rav Yankif laughed, he said, when I, when I turn 90, I'll wear Rabbeinu Tam Tzfilin. The day he turned 90, something he'd said 50 years ago, he's put, put on Rabbeinu Tam Tzfilin, right? Because he, did, he never said something, he was known for his impeccable honesty. Somebody once saw him, in, in all areas, somebody once saw him walking into like a silver shop. He's one of the Ador. He's not walking into a silver shop in New York. So they're wondering, that's very out of character for why you're walking. So they asked him, why do you walk in? So he said, somebody just gave me a gift, a brand new silver becher for Kiddush. And I have to pay taxes on a gift. There's a gift, there's a tax you have to pay. So I went into the silver shop to find out how much this costs so I could report that on my taxes. Wow. Right? That was, and he was known for this. So when he was, what do you call it, he was a Litvak, 
Now, if you know, you know on Pesach people eat gebruks. You know gebruks is where the matzah gets wet. So Hasidim don't eat gebruks. That's why Hasidim don't have matzah balls and they don't have what do you call it kneidlach and the and 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 they 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 some of the Hasidim don't won't put anything. No jelly, no nothing on the matzah. They don't put matzah in the soup. Some Hasidim even eat the matzah out of a plastic bag. They eat the matzah out of a plastic bag. Litvax, like cold, you know, red-blooded Litvax, make a point of eating gebruks. And I personally don't like don't like knedlach, but but the the, the, the real red blood red blooded Litvaks, you know, not only they like the knedlach, they want to make a point because they never bought into this whole minhag of not getting the concern of Gibrux is that maybe some part of the matzah somewhere wasn't fully baked. There's exposed flour and some liquid will touch it, touch it, and it'll turn it into a turn it into chametz. That's where the minhag came from. The Litvaks, the real Litvaks. Never bought into this. Rabbi Yankov Kamenetsky was a, was a Litvak's Litvak, but he didn't eat Gebrugs. So they asked him why. Why did he eat Gebrugs? He said when he was a bucher in Yeshiva, he went to somebody's house for Pesach. He was invited to somebody's house, and he was, he was concerned about the kashras. And they served a certain dish, and he didn't want to eat it. So he said, why aren't you eating it? He said, I don't eat Gebrugs. From the moment he said, I don't eat gebruks, he viewed it as a netter, and he wouldn't eat gebruks from that point on. When did it change? When did it change? When he remarried. The first Pesach that he was married, he had some bachrim at his house. His first wife was Nifter, who was already much older. And his wife, his new wife, the first Pesach she brought out of the dish was gebruks. Now he's got a problem because he doesn't eat gebruk, but he doesn't want to insult her. He doesn't want to hurt his wife's feelings. He was a very sensitive person, and he didn't want to hurt her feelings. So he waited till she left the room, and then he took three of the guys that were there. He made hataras. So he 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 released himself. They did hataras in the dorm. Then she came in. He was able to eat the gebruk. You understand? The, the, we understand what a man this was. This was a, he once had to meet a couple at Grand Central Station in New York at about five in the six in the morning. He had to meet this couple. They were going to travel out in New York together. So he gets to Grand Central Station, and he looks very, very. His, his eyes are red. He looks pretty tired. So they said, "Are you feeling okay?" He said, "Yeah, yeah. I'm just a little tired. I didn't sleep last night." So why not? He says, "Well, I knew I had to get up early to get to here to by six o'clock. I had to get up at four o'clock till I would dive and this, that, the other." And I set my alarm clock, but then I realized that my alarm clock was, it was a hot summer in New York, and the windows were all open. So my next door neighbor is a Gentile, is a goy, and if my alarm clock goes up at four o'clock in the morning, it's gonna wake him up. I have no right to wake him up at four o'clock in the morning, but I also didn't want to oversleep, so I just stayed up all night and I learned, so I'm a little tired. That was the, I'll tell you one, one last time, I wasn't going to mention, I, the, the last thing, this is, I think, is vital for all of us. When he was Nifter, he was living in Muncie, and he was Nifter, and uh, they came to the Shiva, people came to be Menachem Oval. All of a sudden, two or three nuns came walking in. Nuns. So, and Rabbi Yankov was 95 years old when he was Nifter. And these, these three nuns come walking in. So, you know, you get a room full of from Jews and three nuns, you know, that's, uh, you know, and so I'm sure some kid in the back said, well, we'll have none of that. But, the, but the, you know, the, the, what do you call it? The, so these three nuns come walking in and somebody came up to them and said, hi, did, did, did you know the rabbi? He said, yes, we know the rabbi. And he was a very nice man. He said, oh, yeah, did you? Aren't you? Yes, you see, we know that every time we're walking down the streets, and one of the religious Jews would see us, he would always cross over to the other side of the street. The rabbi, when he was walking, see us, the rabbi would walk right up to us, and he would smile and say, good morning, ladies, or good morning, whatever way he dressed them, and he'd greet them. In other words, Rabbi Yankov Kamenetsky, be a mensch. Where does it say that you have to cross the street when you see a nun? You can't cross yourself. But you can, and there's no reason, you can't cross yourself, and there's no reason to cross the street either. We avoid, we avoid crosses all the time, right? And, and hey, why, why can't you say good morning to a nun? Who said you can't say good morning to a nun? They're like, like oh, hey, yeah, we're allergic, what's gonna happen? What do you think, they're gonna, they're gonna grab you and baptize you? I mean, what, what do you think's gonna happen, right? And he just said, that, that was the menschlichkeit. That was, that, that was the menschlichkeit. Okay, so the, that's the first thing the Torah says here. Now, the Torah then says, <clears throat> That a husband, if you look at Pasuk Dalad, 
It says, Ve'isha ki sidor neder la Hashem, ve'osha isar beves avian unreal. Let's say a woman makes a vow. Now here, the Torah says the father, and later on the Torah is going to mention the husband, have veto power. That means if a married woman makes a, a, a girl, a single girl, or a married woman makes a, uh, 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 makes a, makes a neder, the husband has veto power. Now, veto power over here, I don't mean by veto power, I don't mean a mafia king, a mafia, a mafia chief, veto power, you're right. Vito Corleone, uh, the godfather, right? that was veto power. No, that's not what I mean. You know, veto, <laughs> veto power with the submachine, that's not what we're talking about. Veto power means meet veto authority. A woman makes a nether. Now, the difference, let's get something clear before anything. What's the difference between a nether and a shvua? A nether is where you take something permissible and you put it into a forbidden category. So for example, a person says, this meat, let's say somebody, uh, uh, somebody wants to make a netter not to eat red meat. So for the next 30 days, this meat, all red meat is in the category of a korban. Now you're not allowed to eat a korban. So you've made a nether that red meat is off limits to you. A shvua, when you swear, that's simply swearing that something is or isn't or that you will or will do, will, won't do something. A nether generally means putting something in a forbidden category. So let's say there's a woman, and this woman decides that, that, that she, uh, 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 she doesn't want to visit her in-laws. So she's putting, she says, her in-laws home, she is making a nether that she cannot get any benefit from her in-laws home. That means she's putting her in-laws home into a forbidden category. For example, I just that. let's say a woman decides she doesn't want to eat red meat for a month. She wants to go on a special diet, so she says she's putting all, she's making a, v, a, a, a vow that she's not going to put on makeup. She feels she's not being sneezed enough. She's making a vow not to wear makeup for a month. The husband, on the day that he hears her vow, has a right to say veto. He could, null, he could veto her vow. Now there are two things. There's vetoing it, and there, the, it, there is annulling it. There are two different categories here. A veto means that it never took place. I'm not allowing you to go. Why does the husband have veto power? Says Rav Hirsch says that a woman is responsible for creating the home atmosphere, and which is true, by the way, right? They, they, you know the old saying, "A happy wife is a happy life," yeah. and that's why when it comes to the home, gentlemen, never make an issue of anything in the home. Don't make an issue. If the wife chooses pink curtains, just let it go. Just, just say beautiful. Oh, beautiful. Uh, yeah, gorgeous. You know, if she wants different cabinets, whatever she wants. Whatever she wants in the home, it's her home. She's got to be in the home. Whatever she wants, and just say, wow. Think about it first, by the way. If your wife says, how do you like the new curtains? Don't just say, oh, beautiful. Right? You have to look at it and go, hmm. Wow. Yeah, yeah, wow. You know, and if there are other curtains, compare it to other ones. Make it look like you're interested. Right? Make it look like there's something, you know, how do you like the new picture I bought? Wow. Wow. Well, that's not new. That's been there four years. <laughs> That's the new one. I say, no, no. I was just trying to get, uh, 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 you know, I was just trying to get a point, a point of comparison. You know, yeah, wow, yeah, wow. You know, that sort of thing. Don't, don't make an issue. Now the home is hers. Don't make an issue. She's responsible. The whole, the environment of the home is the wife, and therefore, a husband has to be careful. If a wife starts, she vows off of this, and she's not willing. She, she puts things in a forbidden category. That could affect her mood very easily. And therefore, the husband has veto power over what the wife, the, the wife's nether, okay? That's what the Torah says. Now, that being the case, go to uh, Pasuk Yud Gimel. And this we spoke about a couple of days ago, but let's get, let's get a little depth over here. So the Torah says like this, on uh, 902, V'im hafer yafer osam isha. Do you see where that is? It's about 10 lines from the top. The im hafer yafer osam isha biyom sham of her husband nullifies the vow, the vow on the day he hears it. Kol motzas vasel in the rea uli iser nafsha lo yakum. Her vows do not take place. The husband vetoed it. He heard his wife made a, a debtor and he vetoed it. Isha feiram. Her husband has, has, has how does he uh, revoked it? Vashem yislach lo. Hashem should forgive her. So the obvious question is what? Why does she need forgiveness? What does she need forgiveness for? 
Right, so remember we mentioned this the other day? Take a look at Rashi. Pesach Yid Gibble. I think Rashi brings it on earlier on Pesach Vav. Right? Take a look at Pesach Vav. On the previous page. Uh, this is written by the father and the daughter, but it applies by the husband and the wife. Take a look at the left column of Rashi, eight lines from the top, on page 900. Left column. If you find it, please show the person next to you. 900, eight, li- eight columns from the top. It says, Hashem yislach lo. It says Rashi. Everybody see that? It says Rashi. What is the Pusuk talking about? A woman took a nadir that she's going to be a Nazarite. I mean, she's not going to drink wine. She's not going to groom herself. Her husband went and he revoked her vow. He voided it. She didn't know about it. And then she transgresses. And she drinks wine or she comes in contact with a dead body. Zohi should slicha slicha. She needs forgiveness, the Afalpishu Mufar, even though it's been voided. She needs forgiveness. The Imha Mufar in Srichin Slicha, if the ones that have been voided need a, uh, an atonement, Kalvachomer Lashain and Mufar, and all the wolf more so for those that have not been voided. So if somebody, the Torah comes along and says, a woman made a vow. She's not going to drink wine for 30 days. And her husband hears it from the next room, he says, Vito. Vito, she's not going to drink wine. That means we're not going to have wine in the house. I know how my wife shops. Whenever she can't drink wine, then, then nobody's going to have wine. Forget it. I'm not interested. Vito, right? Or she drinks wine, she's in a better mood. I want her to have wine accessible. Vito. Though I imagine nowadays would be equivalent to a woman who's vows off a of coffee. Those days they used to drink wine like we drink coffee. Could you imagine a woman without drinking coffee? A coffee drinker who doesn't drink coffee? Hey, stay away, right? So the husband says, Vito. Okay? Now, she never heard it. She doesn't know. She thinks she's bound by her, by her netter. And then she goes in intentionally. She says, you know what, netter schmetter, I'm drinking some wine. Now, Lior, without the, without the, 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 the track, right? She, she goes and she, 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 uh, she, she, she vows her netter. Now, is she need an atonement or not? Remember, we were speaking about this the other day. When you did something, you intended to do something. Did she do an Avera? Did she do an Avera? Yes or no, from a Torah perspective. She did not do an Avera. She intended to do an Avera. She needs an atonement. So the Gemara says, <coughs> when Rabbi Akiva would come across this Pasuk, each time he came across, Rabbi Akiva would cry. Every time Rabbi Akiva came across this Pasuk, he would cry. The question is, well, what was it about the Pasuk that made him cry, number one? Rabbi Akiva said, listen, if that's what the Torah says about an unintentional, imagine about the intentional. Okay, that we understand. It tells you how severe an Avera is. So Rabbi Akiva would cry. The question is, why Rabbi Akiva? He wasn't the first person who read the Pesach. There were a lot of other Tanaim, a lot of other Amoraim. So why Rabbi Akiva? Why specifically Rabbi Akiva? What's that? He was a Baal Shuvah. He had done sins before. We say it about Baal Shuvah. It says, we're not talking about Baal Shuvah. A Baal Shuvah, the Averas become white, either are wiped out, or if you become do Shuvah, Me'ava, your sins become merits. Nothing can be better than being a Baal Shuvah. Rabbi Kiva, if it was only about, here he's talking about somebody who tried to do an Avera but didn't succeed. Rabbi Kiva cries. Why is he crying? Okay. So, there are several answers. By the way, there's a story with the Chafetz Chaim. A guy stole the Chafetz Chaim's coat. Now, this is a famous story. A guy stole the Chafetz Chaim's coat. And the Chafetz Chaim chased this guy, yelling, I forgive you, I'm Michael, I'm Michael. So when did the story come up? This story came up in court. There was a certain student of the Chafetz Chaim who was accused of something on trumped up charges. And the Chafetz Chaim came to the courtroom as a character witness. And before the Chafetz Chaim spoke, so the defense attorney said to the judge, Your Honor, I just want to tell you something about who this man is who's about to speak. Do you know that somebody once stole his coat and this man ran down the street yelling, I forgive you. So the prosecuting attorney turned to the judge. He says, Your Honor, you don't really believe that story, do you? So the judge said to the prosecuting attorney, Whether I believe it or not is immaterial, but one thing is certain. They don't tell stories like that about you or me. Right? So the fact that the story true, not true, how can they tell you about him and not about me? So that tells you who the Chafetz Chaim was. Whether the story happened or not, I don't know, but I saw a very interesting twist I'd never seen before. They asked the Chafetz Chaim, 
all you had to do was say to yourself or think to yourself, I forgive you. Then the guy's not guilty. The coat is his. Why did you chase him and yell, I forgive you, I'm Michael, I'm Michael. Why did you yell and chase him? Why did you chase him and yell it? Why are you going to send it to yourself? I'm Michael. It's a good question, right? Why do you have to chase him and announce it? As the Chafetz Chaim said, because of this Pasuk. He said, because if the guy doesn't know that I forgive him, then every time he wears that coat, he's going to be intending to put on a coat or thinking he's putting on a stolen coat. So he'll have in mind that he's doing an Avera. By me announcing and yelling it to him, he'll know that it's his and he's not doing that Avera. Because if he thinks he's doing an Avera when he's putting on a coat, even though it's not an Avera, but the fact that he thinks he, he needs more atonement other than stealing. How do you like that? I would have thought of that, would you, Ezra? Right? How do you like that? That's why he ran after him and yelled it. Why was Rabbi Akiva crying? I'll tell you something incredible. Okay, incredible. The, uh, I think it's the Arizal, it says like this. If you remember, Yosef, had, Yosef was sold by his brothers. This is mind-boggling. Yosef was sold by his brothers. Okay, what was their intention? Well, their intention wasn't to kill him. Their intention was to sell him into slavery. Right? They'll become a slave. Eventually, at the end of the story, the brothers come to Egypt. They meet him, and Yosef reveals himself. And the brothers are devastated. And Yosef says, hey, fellas, don't worry about it. You intended to do something not good, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought about great results. I became the viceroy over here, and this was the way that the whole family is saved, because now I have provisions for everybody. Terrific. But on this, based on this principle, what happens to the brothers? You intended to do something not good. You intended to sell them off into slavery. And what happens? Something good happened. It doesn't make you exotic. Ironically, we never find that the brothers are punished. Brothers are never punished for that. However, look back at Parshas Vayigash. Look back at Parshas Vayigash. Page 252. Yosef reveals him to his brothers. And then 252, two lines from the bottom. Yosef says, Ve'ata and now, lo atem shalachtem osiheinu. You didn't send me here. Ki ha'elokim, God did. Ve'yesimeni la'av le'paro lo'do l'chol beis. He made me the leader in Egypt. The Mephorshim say, what's that word ve'ata? And now. Well, he's in the middle of talking to them. He says, Hashem sent me here, and now you didn't send me, God sent me. What's the vato? What's now? What's that got to do with anything? Unfortunately, say Yosef was saying, now there's no punishment. But sometimes the line, the line there's got to be accountability. Where is that accountability? When is there going to be a punishment? The, martyrs. the ten martyrs. Remember the ten martyrs we read about on Yom Kippur and on Tisha B'Av? The ten martyrs who are brutally tortured to death by the Romans. So the Arizal says they were reincarnation of Yosef's brothers. And who was the one who was the, who was the main catalyst of this plot to send Yosef? To sell Yosef? It was Shimon. Shimon. And who was the reincarnation of Shimon? Rabbi Akiva. Oh, not only that. How many people from the tribe of Shimon died in the plague? 24,000. How many Talmidim of Rabbi Akiva's died? 24,000. Right? So Rabbi Akiva is a reincarnation of Shimon. Since Shimon was, Ruvain tried to save him. Yehuda came along and said, sell him. But the catalyst of the plot was Shimon. So he's got the biggest accountability of making an effort to do something negative which comes out positive. And Rabbi Akiva, at some level of his neshama, whether conscious or subconscious, senses that there's an accountability. And therefore, when Rabbi Akiva came across this pasuk, he cried because he understood that at some level that his punishment is going to be the harshest punishment. And therefore, Rabbi Akiva is the one he's raked apart by the Romans. That's why Rabbi Akiva cried when he saw this pasuk. Unbelievable, isn't it? Unbelievable. So Rabbi Akiva, that's what the, I forgot who it says it, but it, the, the, the Arizal is the one that says that the ten, the ten martyrs are a reincarnation of the brothers. That's why in the entire dialogue over there, if you read, remember what the dialogue is, 
the dialogue is the Roman emperor saying to them, what's the punishment for kidnapping and stealing? And we don't find that they were ever punished, and therefore you ten are going to get it. That's the entire dialogue over there. And they're re and they're Rizal says they're a reincarnation, and that's why Rabbi Kiva's crying, because he's the one who gets the, he gets the worst punishment. Uh, unbelievable, unbelievable. Okay, take a look at... Um, Periklam and Aleph, Pasuk Aleph. Oh, by the way, I did, I did want to mention something else. I did want to mention something else. Because this is a, 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 a halachic concept here. There's a difference between voiding, voiding a, 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 the vow, which is what the husband or father is allowed to do, where they have veto power, and releasing a person from a vow. Okay, now what that means is, what's, there's hafaras neder, the father vetoes it, there's something called hatoras nedorim. Hatoras nedorim is that a person made a netter, and then your person feels bound by their netter, and they need to get out of it. So you have to go to a Torah scholar, and he has to find what's called a Pesach, an opening, a release. What would be an example? Say somebody makes a vow that he's not going to eat red meat for six months. No red meat. And then a month later, a month in, he's invited to a wedding, and at the wedding, they're, set, they're, they're, they're serving ribs. And he's sitting there watching everybody. So he's eating his fruit plate, and everybody's say, eating ribs because he's bound by a netter. And now he wants to get out of his netter. So he has to go to a Tabel Chacham, who knows what he's doing. And he has to find a way of releasing him, or he could sometimes find a way. And he says to them the following. At the point that you made the netter, would you have made that netter had you known that there's going to be ribs served sometime in the next guy hasn't eaten ribs in 20 years? Had, you, had I known that my netter includes ribs, I would never have done it. At that point, you say, okay, then the netter retroactively is released. There was never a netter, it was a mistaken netter. You understand? It's called, a, it's called to release him from his netter. Had I known that this was going to happen, I would have never made that netter. So, so let's say a person decides he's not going to eat meat, and, he, and all of a sudden he gets to the point where he's getting depressed. Had I known then that this would be my reaction, I would have never made the netter. That's uh, what's called a valid release, and he's released from his netter. That means your netter was a mistake. Okay? That's what's called to release somebody. It needs a, obviously somebody who, somebody who knows what he's doing. Now, that's one of the reasons the Mishnah in Pirkei Elba says that the Mishnah says certain things you don't do. One of the things is, don't try to calm a person down when he's angry. Don't comfort a person when his, the dead has not yet been buried. Right? The Mishnah in Pirkei Elva says, why don't you comfort somebody if the, before the burial? Because he's not in a state of being comforted at that point. There hasn't been closure yet. You, it, the, the comforting, is, the comforting is, 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 number one, it's not going to accomplish anything. Number two, there's almost a sense of insensitivity. Wait, you don't see what's going on. His relative is lying there, is lying there in a coffin, and you're trying to calm him down. You got comforting him. There's a, he's he's in, in a height, height point of grief. Same thing when a person gets angry. How come you don't like being calmed down when you're angry? Person's angry it says, "Don't, don't. What do you call it? I'll, I'll, uh, 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 what's it called? Al to dachamenu, al to something bishas kaso. Don't calm him down when he's angry. Why not? Because when you try to calm me down, if I'm angry." He said, listen, just calm down. It's not so bad. You're trivializing what's important to me. When you're angry, it's okay. Try to calm down. There. Oh, my anger is that when I get angry about it, it's okay. But when I'm angry, you try to calm down. Don't, don't, don't calm down. Most of the time when you calm down a person who's angry, what happens? It just gets angrier. The same Mishnah says, don't prompt somebody when he makes a netter. If you hear somebody make let's say somebody makes a netter that he's not going to eat meat. Don't sit there and say, are you, including, are you including turkey? Yeah, turkey too. What about ribs? Yeah, ribs also, right? Why shouldn't you prompt him? Because by prompting him, all you're doing is gonna make it harder for him to get released later on. You understand? And therefore it says, don't prompt somebody while he's making a nether, don't help him out. Don't go, you know, do you mean this? Do you mean that? Do you mean the other? Because all you're gonna do is, all you're gonna do is you're gonna create a situation, <coughs> sorry, where it's even more difficult for it, okay? Um, okay, now take a look at the bottom of 902. Yes, somebody had a question. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Is a person bound by an error they make in anger or in 
you could get out of it by saying, but there is room for it to say, had I, you know, had I known, you know, I, I was in a in a state of anger, and that's why I did it. Sometimes there's something called a, 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 a mistaken netter, and there's a netter of there's what there's there's one uh, category where let's say you're buying something from somebody. I'm buying something from you. You're a businessman. I'm trying to buy something from you, and you say, "Listen, I'm making." There, you know, I, I'm making a netter. It's not going to be less than 500. And I say, I make it. I'm not paying you more than 300. We both know we're going to compromise and make it 400. That's that's not considered about it. There are certain categories of of nedarim that are that are not considered as a netter. A netter made out of anger. That's usually when a person makes a netter is when they're angry, and then it needs a release. Then it needs a release. He's bound by the netter, but he's got to get a release. It, it's, just, it's not that difficult to get a release as long as you leave room for the release. Yes, mayor. Does Kol Nidre also... Kol Nidre only if... Kol Nidre is only if you remember it at the... Well, it's not even Kol Nidre, it's the Hataras Nadarim that we do on Erev Rosh Hashanah. Mm -hmm. But then you would have to remember that you did it at the time that you made the netter. It's very... We don't rely on that. We don't rely on that as a, as a release. Kol Nidre, that we start Rosh Hashanah with Kol Nidre... Uh, sorry, Yom Kippur. Sorry, Yom Kippur with Kol Nidre, there are different explanations from it. One of them is... That it's like a, almost a potato. I mean, why, why would we do that? I ever wonder about that? Kol Nidre. Most people don't even know what the words mean. Most people think, think that Kol Nidre means we are sinners. Forgive us. We won't do it. Kol Nidre is all, all netters that we've made. Should be. Why are we saying Kol Nidre? So one of the explanations is that in case Hashem has Chas Hashem made a netter that somebody's life should be terminated, he should be willing to, to, vow, to, to release himself from the netter symbolically. And the other is uh, there are commentaries that say that Kol Nidre is because most of our sins, or a high percentage, have to do with the mouth. Just like a netter has to do with the mouth. And on Yom Kippur, where we're, we're saying, you know, clopping out chait over there, because a lot of the chaits come from you know, sins of the mouth. Yeah. Somebody was going to ask something. Ezra, were you going to ask something? Oh, I was just going to suggest that maybe it was because of, like, the same way that we had the, the he goat was for a cover up for sins that we don't remember. Maybe I think there is somebody who says that also in case we in case we bound ourselves. Yeah, there there is such an idea. Yeah, there's such an idea. Yeah, yeah. So. Also, when we say that nader, even if it's out of anger, do we have to say this is a nader or just basic words? Like just saying something. If a person says sometimes that you can make a nader just through your actions. If you do something three times, if you do something three times and you don't say bleed nader, you can be bound by it. So let's say a person goes to the mikvah three days in a row. So he, he may be bound by netter. So it's good to say I'm doing this bleed netter. The guy s starts learning dafyomi, goes to dafyomi, sure. Say, but, I, but I'm not taking on as netter. You make it, just make sure you make a, I'm not taking on as a netter. When it constitutes three times, where, what units are considered part units is always complex. But it's ideal to, to always to get used to saying bleed netter. Whenever you enter, somebody asks you, are you going to meet me? Could you meet me tomorrow? It's bleed netter. I mean, Blee Netter in certain places has, has come to mean, you know, take a hike, Jack. You know, <laughs> my brother told me he was once in his yeshiva and there was the Arab worker. And he said to him, uh, you know, uh, Faiz, uh, we need some paper towels here by the bathroom. He said, yeah, Blee Netter, Blee Netter. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> we know what that means. <laughs> They're still waiting for those paper towels. That's what, that's what Blee Netter means. He, he knows what it means. There's actually an Arab bus. Uh, there's an Arab bus driver in in, in Israel, a famous bus driver who guys picks up yeshiva guys and he'll say to them, "Hey, what me, what masechta are you learning?" You know, he'll start asking. He knows all the yeshivas. What masechta are you learning? A baba kama, can baba kama. <laughs> all right. There's another. There's a famous Arab barber. There's a when they, when they when they walk in, the guys will walk. In. Oh, he's not here. He's a, he's just a regular barber who could identify a guy where, from when a guy walks in, he could tell him which yeshiva he learns at. Something about his body language. All right. Okay.